Thank you, Robin, for the kind introduction, and uh, welcome back to another uh, ENS IG uh, Insights series, everyone. Uh, today, I'm very honored to be introducing Professor Rajri Agua. Uh, she is a chair of the professor in strategy and entrepreneurship at the University of Maryland. She's also director of S. Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets. Her research primarily focuses on the evolution of industries, firms, and individual careers. And her recent research links knowledge diffusion among firms, industries, and regions to the underlying mechanisms of employee entrepreneurship and mobility. Overall, she has published more than 60 studies and has been cited more than 11,000 times. Uh, she has also received numerous best paper awards and funded uh, by grants from the Kauffman Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the National Science Foundation, among others. She is currently the co-editor of the Strategic Management Journal and has previously served as co-editor at Strategic Entrepreneurship Journal and senior editor at Organization Science. And today, she is here to chat about why we should expand our conceptualization of individuals at the workplace beyond human capital to human enterprise. So without further ado, uh, Rajshree, please uh, take the floor. No. Thank you, Wesley. Um, and I'm particularly pleased. I was also one of the things that I've been very honored to be was one of the founding officers of the Strategic uh, Strategy and Entrepreneurship Interest Group. So it is particularly uh, gratifying to see all of you young enterprising people that have taken this to whole new heights. I'm being told that Strategy and Entrepreneurship IG received one of the maximum number of submissions this year. What an achievement. You guys should be very, very proud. So thank you again for um, inviting me for this insights uh, panel. I'm going to share screen so that um, you can see the presentation deck too. Wesley, am I good? Uh, do you oh, share, good. Do you good. Yeah. share screen? Yep. Yes? All good. Um, the, pres the PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Can be viewed, right? Yes. Thank yeah. you. And I noticed in the participant or attendees list are some really, really uh, close friends and co-authors, uh, old friends and um, new acquaintances and uh, new co-authors too. So thank you again for um, spending your time with me. I'm going to be talking about some of the recent insights that I've had based on recent work and why we should think about moving beyond human capital and connecting human enterprise to strategic entrepreneurship. And because the focus of my talk is on human enterprise and individuals, you'll notice that a very deliberate aspect is not only to call out the work of the people that I'm going to be relying on, including my co-authors, but also the people themselves. So I'll begin by saying that I'm very, very proud to carry the names of both Rudy Lamone and Ed Snyder under my own, because both of these people have been very, very enterprising. Rudy Lamone in academia and Ed Snyder in business, and in fact have been inspiring me by their own human enterprise. So just to give you kind of a flavor very quickly about the, if you will, the landscape of research that I have been interested in. I started, as some of you might know, um, in economics, studying industrial organization. Uh, and at that time, most of my early research was under my advisor, Michael Gord, who had a very influential um, uh, experience, you know, um, it was a great influence on my own work. And then more recently, also with people like Evan Starr and Raj Chaudhry, where we're looking at the dynamics of artificial intelligence and machine learning and complementarities with human capital, or with Sojin and Maka on the incubation of brand new industries. In addition, after my first foray into this looking at industry evolution very seriously, I also moved into strategy, thinking much more about the competitive and even collaborative dynamics from firms and industries. And in doing so, I matched firm evolution into industry evolution. And then I moved into entrepreneurship, you know, how are firms created and the strategic dynamics among individuals and firms. And here, my co-authors, uh, 
uh, that really made me learn a lot of things and I benefited from the complementary talents that they provided me. I see that Ben is part of the um, attendee list, but Raj, MB, April, Martin Genko, Seth Carnahan, all of them influenced uh, my work in this area. And then finally, also because I'm taking individuals and their careers very seriously, and also as fountain heads of all of the uh, more macro level phenomena that we observe, the individual slash team dynamics based on knowledge context. And here at Sushi Ohama, Sergey Briginsky, Sonali Shah are some of my co-authors that have uh, really uh, helped me understand some of these phenomena. So as you can see, uh, across my career life cycle itself, I have moved actually from more macro to micro, and then from the micro to a systems perspective. So what I'm going to hopefully talk to you today is this role of individuals and teams as they underpin the macro strategic and entrepreneurship phenomena at the farm and industry and even economy level. So what do I mean by this, right? Uh, I want to start off with, again, this industry or technology view. And this quote by Rosenberg, where he talks about how building industries really requires building knowledge. And notice here that he's privileging differences of opinion. Exploration around a wide variety of alternative paths is especially desirable in nascent industry stages when uncertainties are particularly high. And notice he's saying individuals with differences of opinion, often based on differences in access to information, need to be encouraged to pursue their own hunches or intuitions. So both diversity and numerosity of viewpoints and experiments become very, very critical to building industries. At the firm level, we've got the knowledge-based view of the firm, and Grant says it very pithily. Firms exist because they can create conditions under which multiple individuals can integrate their specialist knowledge. And then, of course, this also means that employees can move, and a lot of the research that I've done for much of the 2000s has been on employee mobility and entrepreneurship. And here, Simon reminds us that all learning takes place inside individual heads. An organization learns in only two ways, either by the learning of its members or by ingesting new members who have knowledge the organization didn't previously have. Now, this, of course, is all alluding to the capabilities of individual, the knowledge that they bring, the human capital that they possess. And it behooves us to go back in time to think about the pioneers of human capital itself. So here you have Schultz talking about the importance of human capital. Acquisition of knowledge and skills that have economic value are a product of investment and combined with other human investment predominantly account for the superiority of technologically advanced countries, right? So now you're implicating human capital even more than physical capital. Uh, and this distinction that Marx made about just labor and capital, where labor is just hours of um, you know, physical work, if you will. Here, the focus on human capital becomes more relevant. Though that said, even at that pioneering time, they hesitated about this concept of human capital. So notice that Schultz in this pioneering essay also talks about deep-seated moral and philosophical issues in treating individuals as property or marketable assets, resulting in the mere thought of investment in human beings as offensive. Similarly, Becker talks about the belief in the exploitation of labor by capital could result in problematic interpretations that human capital exploits labor too, with skilled and unskilled laborers pitted against each other in this alleged class conflict between labor and capital. And of course, notice that particularly in today's conversation, this issue that Becker was so concerned about is becoming increasingly relevant as we're talking about income inequality. Nevertheless, a huge focus on investments 
And you have 40 to 50 years of economic scholarship that discusses investment in learning, largely through education and experience, and then the returns to these investments at the firm, individual, and economy level. And this has led to an emphasis on capabilities, knowledge, skills, and experience, and the monetary returns to investment. So non-pecuniary drivers, motivation, self-esteem, preferences, aspirations, they're either incorporated in this body of knowledge as non-cognitive abilities or as compensating differential. In fact, you're willing to give up on money because of these pecuniary uh, motivations. In, this was in economics, of course, a parallel literature on strategic management on human capital has been utilized a lot in the resource and knowledge-based view that to be a source of competitive advantage, you have to ask the question, is human capital resources valuable, rare, inimitable, and organized well? And so scholars have talked about strategies for firms for superior profitability in product markets because of superior bargaining power in labor markets. And so the focus on team-based capabilities, firm-specific training, systems rather than individual human resource practices are all ways in which our seminal scholars have talked about how to leverage human capital for firm competitive advantage. Within entrepreneurship, with Sonali, I ended up uh, reviewing huge bodies of knowledge on user entrepreneurship, academic entrepreneurship, and employee entrepreneurship to talk about why founder human capital and knowledge is so critical to success, not only because of the core knowledge, but also access to complementary assets, including relational capital. Many of the attendees here have contributed to this very rich literature stream. So if you were to summarize this concept of human capital, definition, knowledge, experiences, and skills of an individual, very much of an accumulated stock of past investments that are now being leveraged for monetary returns. So the focal question becomes, what are the capabilities that comprise human capital? Theoretical base is very much economics. And the sources of individual heterogeneity is really about differences in ability and past human capital investments. Implications for firm, and strategy, uh, firm strategy and performance is that you really need to cap create and capture value by harnessing these human capital resources through firm structures and strategies, including training and coordination of complementary human capital. And at the individual level, we've done a lot in terms of thinking about how mobility and entrepreneurship decisions are primarily driven by the desire to capture rents from past investments in human capital, including innovation projects. So to summarize, the dominant focus in strategy and entrepreneurship has been on capabilities and pecuniary in incentives and rewards at both the individual and firm level. So these dynamics that I was talking to you about in terms of firms and individuals kind of co-creating co value, but then also thinking about how to share rents has been the focus of most of our study. I wanna pause here and ask each and every one of us, are we really reduced to only our capabilities? And do we only care about making money? In fact, I would argue that all of you who are listening to my webinar today are all bright minds, lots and lots of capabilities, and you could be making a lot more money being CEOs and leaders in business and society. So why is it that we are only thinking of ourselves as individuals as being our capabilities and motivated by only making money? And so thinking through this, really in the past has caused me to revisit some of these implicit assumptions we make by taking a very dominant human capital framework. And so what I'm gonna do is talk through three studies that have really influenced my thought process on why we should be thinking about this concept of human enterprise. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is really where we implicate stable shared leadership 
This is where individuals come together to create not only founding teams, but top management teams. And what we're looking at here is the centers of gravity. So this is with Atsushi Oyama as well as Sergey Brzezinski. And this goes back to this literature that was my home base, where I did my dissertation on industry evolution and firm growth and performance, right? So in this literature, very established stylized facts, if you will, is that there's outside versus inside industry knowledge, and that kind of dictates where or uh, how industries evolve. But it begs the question, who brings the knowledge? And the literature has also talked about returns to scale, product and process innovation, but it begs the question, which firms increase scale among seemingly identical small startups and who organizes the innovation? And then of course, the literature has talked about first mover advantage and pre-entry experience, begs the question, who among the first movers actually build on what types of experience? And so to unpack each of these, um, big shout out to Sergey, created this amazing database on the Japanese cotton spinning industry. You can see that I'm really taking you back in time to the 18th, to the 19th through the early 20th century. And the reason this is important is that the cotton spinning industry has been attributed for Japan's ascension as the only country in the East to be receiving the developed country status. And you can see that there's huge growth in this industry that has contributed to the economy's growth too. Now in this industry, even though there are hundreds of firms at any point in time, seven firms become the centers of gravity across multiple measures. So what do we mean by centers of gravity? Close to 70% of the industry output can be attributed to these seven firms, and they have almost three times as much product varieties as other firms. More importantly, these big seven firms were the most innovative of all of these firms and also attracted most of the industry's top talent. Indeed, engineering talent was very, very scarce in the, in the country at that time. And 80 of the university educated and 70% of the technical school engineers in cotton spinning industry were employed by these top seven center of gravity firms. So in our research design, what we did is use historical narratives and data to conduct both quantitative and qualitative analysis. We had all firms in the industry for all years in this 1883 to 1914 period, information on all founding top management team members. And we used the quantitative analysis more like a searchlight to establish stable empirical regularities, the ones that I just showed you. And then we did qualitative analysis to elucidate mechanisms and think about causality in a much, much more precise way than allowed by econometric identification strategies. And what we found is that the centers of gravity, as opposed to other firms, had much, much more time spent under shared leadership, which was also stable. So multiple top management team members that are charting the strategic direction of the firm. And it's not that these top management team members did not experience discord or conflict. However, they ended up they, they, the discords were at the similar rates. However, very early they figured out how to manage discords in a manner that they had stable shared leadership. So without going into too much of the details of the, um, uh, the study itself, revisiting those causes of industry evolution and firm performance, what we show in this paper is that yes, it's outside versus industry inside knowledge, but that's because the top management teams were able to combine higher engineering, operational and marketing talent, not necessarily because they came from high status merchant families or government connection. You do see returns to scale product and process innovation, but all executed much, much better 
by the teams that had stable shared leadership because these top management team members had complementarities and expertise and shared vision to organize the innovation. And among seemingly identical firms, the firms that were able to create the working unit of shared and stable experience within their TMTs were the ones that were able to grow. Now, why is it that I'm saying that this is human enterprise and not just monetary uh, rewards out here? Because one of the things that we consistently see is that the resolution of discords or conflicts by these teams were created because of a focus on value creation, on ethical resolution of um, infractions, if you will, of, you know, say embezzlement and so on. You see firms um, where people are embezzling, but the firms that became centers of gravity really resolved these ethically well. And if there were strategic disagreements, they were always resolved not based on position and power, but on what was right for value creation and customer focus of the firms. The second study is looking not so much at top management team members, but on the founding team members themselves. And so this one is actually a study in which I criticize my own earlier work in terms of some of the inferences that I made. So Raj, uh, MB, April, and I had written this 2004 paper, which received the AMJ Best Paper Award. And it is situated in this received view of spin-out formation and performance, where you have innovation projects that create opportunities. Individuals and teams that are working on these innovation projects have access to them. And so you have spin-out formation, either because of agency or because of um, knowledge spillovers. And so within this context, this paper that I, I still am very proud of, the research design in that examined the knowledge transfer between firms and employee turned founders, but notice that it had firms as the unit of analysis, even though it was examining employee founders. And what we showed there is that the spin outs were a result not of abundant knowledge per se, but underexploited knowledge. And that firms established firms that had both technological and market pioneering capabilities had lower rates of spin outs. All of that is good. And I think that those results still stand. We inferred, however, this received view of spin out formation that pre existing teams were working together at the parent firm and they're going to leave to exploit that knowledge in a new venture. So, when we went back and revisited Agarwal et al. with the same founders of the same disk drive firms, we ended up looking at um, the disk drive industry. We gathered contact with these founders. So the, the 2004 piece was all secondary data, all archival and quantitative data. But here, uh, Sonali, um, uh, you know, went ahead and contacted these founders. And they were, we were successful in getting 23 founders. Some of them we couldn't get because this was that's disconnected phones, no forwarding address. And we had open-ended interviews with follow-up and clarifying questions, very much using qualitative um, uh, met methodological techniques. So what we found is that that inference, that innovation projects in, or capabilities is what led to founding was actually not quite right. And that we, we experienced the fact that ring leaders, there's one core ring leader that chooses to venture out. And while fertile opportunities and making money is kind of there, obviously as one incentive, the critical big incentives are pull incentives such as the desire to create. Desire for equity, not in terms of money, but in terms of fairness. So whenever they talked about money, it wasn't about how much money I could make, but more of this issue of, wait a minute, I, you know, I, I saved the parent company millions and millions of dollars and all I got for it was a hundred dollar check, right? Or they were pushed by their parent company because they were shaped by bureaucracy, interpersonal friction, strategic disagreements, all of the things that we also saw in the centers of gravity paper in the cotton spinning industry. 
And so when these ringleaders left, they actually sought out co-founders. And many of these co-founders didn't necessarily work with them in an immediate innovation project. But they went and sought them out with this focus on complementary skills, cherry picking the best talent, but making sure that there was value alignment. So the co-founders that joined the ring leaders also had the desire to create, but they looked at the possibility of returning to paid employment as a safety net. The reason why these motivations become important is that they also then define the founding team characteristics, their strategies, and their outcomes. And in particular, the firms that were more successful among the spin-outs had synergies in both talents and what we call workplace values. So the study's insights for me was there's a primacy on people, not innovation projects or technologies. And for the better founders, as for the better spin-outs, money is the reward, not the reason. And the team processes reveal that all teams focused on ensuring complementary functional expertise. But the more successful teams additionally paid attention to similarity in talent. So there was positive assortive matching using Becker's technical terms. And more importantly, there was an alignment on goals, values, and non-monetary motivations. So this received view of formation, spin-out formation that we ourselves had ascribed to in the 2004 paper was in fact not supported by the qualitative data. And instead what we saw was this endogenous creation of superior opportunities because better ring leaders attracted better co-founders, not just on the capabilities basis, but also on value alignment. And that created a successful spin. A third study is, as you can see, with a lot of micro OB scholars too. So in addition to Brent Goldfarb uh, and myself here, who are much more on the strategy and entrepreneurship side, we had Maran Lazar, Ella uh, Miran Spector, Miriam Erez, and Gilad Hen, who are micro OB scholars. And we came together to really examine this formation of entrepreneurial teams. And we call this paper that's conditionally accepted at AMJ, mixing business and friendship. You're often told, don't mix business and friendships together. But as most of you, several of you who are uh, attending this happen to also be my very close co-authors as well as friends, I have never ever practiced not mixing. Um, business and friendship in my collaborative teams too, right? And so what we find in this one is that there are, in our literature, when we think about strategies for entrepreneurial team formation, typically we say the economics lens is focusing on resource seeking. So the focus is on complementarities of human capital. And the social psychology lens is focusing on similarity attraction theory. So focus on close relationships with similar others. And it's either or. What we find in this paper and then support, hypothesize, and then also support um, in, in actual causal formation is that when you have teams that employ both resource seeking strategy and similarity attraction strategy, that's very, very hard to do. And precisely because it is rare and unimitable, it creates superior performance. When these teams are able to think about not just complementary assets, but also uh, complementary capabilities, but also shared alignment, they create learning systems, the transactional memory systems that are more efficient. And so they can pivot and experiment as is necessary better than teams that are created with only one strategy. And that's what results in superior venture performance. So what did I learn from these three studies to kind of give you a summary view of how my own thinking has changed? It has given me an appreciation for the importance of purpose as in values and aspiration as in psychological drivers. And it's not that I don't believe that human capital is not important, but that these deep seated moral and philosophical issues that Schultz and Becker were talking about also define us. And so we need to integrate theories of human motivation with theories of human capital. 
And here we can talk a lot more about expectancy theory, reinforcing theory. That's very similar to economic models of cost benefits and carrots and sticks. But we can also start to incorporate equity or justice theories and needs as in self-esteem, self-actualization, self-determination theory, goal setting theory. And of course, the pursuit of dual strategies for high alignment among individuals to achieve complementarities. So the reason why I'm using the term enterprise is that we typically think about enterprise in this third definition, a unit of economic organization or activity. But I'd like us to focus a lot more on this term enterprise to help us define human enterprise as a project or undertaking that is especially difficult, complicated or risky or this readiness to engage in daring or difficult action. So if we do this, then systematically, we can be thinking about how to move beyond human capital. So it's not that knowledge, experiences, and skills are not important, but how are these developed? And what is the activity, the systematic purposeful activity that is daring and difficult that combines both capabilities and aspirations of the individuals? And the focus is not just on past investments, but also how do aspirations and values define current and future investments of activities that can build human capital. The focal question becomes why do individuals pursue different activities and how does this shape and benefit human capabilities? So we're incorporating a lot more of the psychology and even philosophy lens because the difference in individuals results not just from their human capital, but also their motivations and purpose. Implications for firm strategy and performance is that you're not just creating and capturing value through complementary human capital, but also thinking about how organizational identification of individuals can result in, a, in an alignment of individual purpose and organizational purpose. And then implications for mobility and entrepreneurship stem from the fact, as you've seen in the uh, Jewels in the Crown piece, that mobility and entrepreneurship decisions are not just driven by rent capture from past human capital investments, but also to achieve non-pecuniary goals and to assure alignment of purpose. So this is actually something that I have been uh, talking a lot in my um, high school programs too. As I tell aspiring students who wanna go into college, how do they take charge of their own life um, as they're trying to now chart their future? So I talk about this concept of human enterprise as a trader Sudoku. There are nine parts to each of these Sudokus. And dare I say, some of you have, you know, one of the questions I'm asked more often than not in most career um, and consortium based activities is what is your secret of collaboration with so many high quality co-authors um, and how am I able to be so productive in these teams? Here's my secret, right? If I were to tell you what is it that I now think about in terms of collaborative co-author relationships, they have been formed by the study of human enterprise. So there's typically a me for each and every one of us, whether we're engaging in enterprising intellectual entrepreneurship as research scholars, or we're studying enterprising individuals in the uh, for-profit or non-profit space. So there's always a me, the perspective that you wanna take, but then there is this you, this potential collaborator that you can seek to get value off in a team-based or an organizational-based approach. And if you think about it in terms of transactions, it's what am I doing? What are you doing? Right now, I'm talking to you about the work that has influenced my thinking and you're listening and absorbing what I'm doing, right? So we can look at it at this very transactional level, even in this hour that we're spending with each other. So that's four parts of the trader Sudoku. But the question then becomes, 
what is the common objective that are, we're accomplishing together? So in all of the things that you could have been doing during this hour, why did you choose to spend time with me talking about this, right? What is it? How does this fit in my aspirations? How does it fit in your aspirations and your values and missions? And then, of course, capabilities matter. What do I bring to the table? What do you bring to so if we think about it in this manner, then human capital is only focusing on capabilities. And it's assuming that the common objective is making money. And it misses out on a lot more of these issues. So how might our methodological toolkit change to both theory build and theory test research questions related to human enterprise, right? So methodological implications, all of the studies that I talked to you about, uh, you know, it wasn't using, so yes, I am still a quantitative scholar. I still believe in secondary data and archival analysis, but I now realize that these leads to a study of attribute and outcomes, but not processes and motivations. So theoretically, we need to embrace selection, not just control for it. The selection of the me versus you. And organizations have multiple yous and me's combined together with this common purpose. So we need to think about who's selecting in and who's selecting out. What are the interdependencies in abilities and aspiration? And this requires us to focus on abduction, not just induction or deduction, and a triangulation across qualitative, quantitative, and historical data. So examining human enterprise reveals underpinnings and highlights potential misattribution and errors and inferences, like I told you that I personally did in the Agarwal et al. 2004, by revisiting enduring questions in strategy and entrepreneurship. And it requires more use of abduction, inference to the best explanation by triangulating across quantitative, qualitative, and historical data. So what I will leave you with are these two quotes that exemplify for me the two components of human enterprise. The first is aspiration. We're told that talent, think human cap capital, creates its own opportunities, but it sometimes seems that intense desire creates not only its own opportunities, but also its own talents. And the second quote focuses not on past capabilities, but a continuation of capabilities. So it focuses on learners rather than learned. In times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And I often say to my co-authors and my students, the day I say I'm an endowed professor, I'm learned, is the day that I've signed my death certificate. So I look forward to your interactions and question and answer so that I can continue to learn and grow. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Rajri. Um, and at this point, we're open to Q&A. So if you have a question, please uh, uh, do uh, write your question in Q&A session or simply say question in the Q&A session. And I will unmute you uh, in the order in which your question is received. Uh, and then you can directly communicate with uh, with uh, the Rajri. I think someone raised their hand as well. Mute Yong. I think Yong was just talking about chat being unmuted. Yeah. Yong, you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Since I'm giving the opportunity, I would like to ask a question. Um. Uh, can you see me now? Can't see you, but I can uh, hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, Morning, Rashuri, and everybody. Um, always great to uh, hear you talk and speak, uh, Rashuri. Um, and so uh, when you talk about human capital, you know, uh, it's defined as knowledge, skills, and experience, et cetera. And so accumulated stock, uh, and it could be extended to also include flows. Um, in entrepreneurship, there is also some literature talking about the innate ability. Yes. Uh, endowed talent, if you will. So where, that, where does that fit in? Well, of course it fits in, uh, in terms of the fact that your innate capabilities 
are going to make you feel, uh, you know, more apt to do some skills more than others. But I honestly am not uh, a big person. So I very much ascribe to the growth mindset rather than the static mindset. And I also agree that, you know, there's a lot more that you can do with the capabilities and the talents that you have uh, that you are under ascribing if you don't pursue your aspirations or the same capabilities, same innate abilities can lead you in different directions based on where it is that your aspirations take you. So it's not to underplay the role of innate ability or even acquire human capital, but it's to beg the question, where are you going to apply these innate abilities and acquired human capital at any point in time when you've got multiple choices? And then I also think that in entrepreneurship, one of the things that we end up doing with this innate ability, psychological traits, assuming that they're fixed, is that we also look at one shot decisions as opposed to career evolutions, right? So I'll give you an example of my own aspect, graduate, you know, going into PhD in economics, I had the option and I was thinking seriously about whether I should go the labor econ route or the industrial organization route. And I chose to go in the industrial organization route at that time, but that didn't mean that my interests in human capital and labor economics were, were, that were latent were never going to be exercised upon. But there was a deliberate choice at some point in time based on where my intellectual curiosity was leading me that I bought it back. So I guess my answer to you is innate capabilities matter, not as much as we think it does. And it also begs the question on where it is that these capabilities are going to be applied. And there is where aspirations play an important role. Asim? Hey, Rajvi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, lovely presentation, Rajvi, as always. I, am, I know I'm always a learner when you're presenting. Um, I was just thinking, and, and this is not a criticism, this is really, I'm curious. I mean, some of what you were talking about, you know, we, I mean, think about the sort of tradition of thinking about cronyism or elitism in business and this idea that people who kind of had, were homophilous and kind of, you know, fit together, were more successful and were able to keep kind of marginalized populations out. How do we think about that in the world where, you know, sustainable competitive advantage comes from having strong shared purpose values uh, and social ties? Yeah, so thank you for asking this question, Asim. You know, just recently and in preparation for this uh, this presentation, I was revisiting Rosenberg's economic experimentation. Uh, you know, economic experiments, 1992 paper. I would highly, highly recommend this piece along with um, how the West grew rich that he has written. The reason I bring this to your attention is because he does a comparison and he talks about Marx in part because that is also where the original notion of big elites, big corporations, um, this dynamics of marginalized populations versus not comes in. And one of the things that I really appreciated reading his work is this notion of shared purpose, but also the freedom to experiment the freedom to go with your hunches, as I was citing him earlier, that is the hallmark of market economies, right? Not cronyism. Cronyism is actually a mixed economy where you're looking at the government influence and intervention in everyday business. And he talks a lot about why there are problems with that approach. Now, as it relates to your issue of elitism, there is a very nice paper by Doug North, as well as his student, um, John Wallace, who talks about the fact that, you know, in every economy, there are going to be elites and non-elites. The question is, what defines elites versus non-elites? And is there freedom of movement between the elites and the non-elites? And one of the things that John Wallace talks about is that when economies allow for free movement into the elite aspects 
and free movement out of the elites, in part because you have market institutions that bolster this. And so you don't have cronyist uh, systems where the big and the powerful can get together with each other and stay powerful. This is where the big difference is in terms of even which economies prosper. So bigger question, Asim, than I can take on, but here's a a, a view that I have. And then my most recent Forbes op-ed actually takes on this um, seeming dichotomy between purpose and profit and talks about the meaning of work, particularly, Aline, this gets to your question too that you're asked, uh, you've asked next. And this is about, uh, you know, the meaning of work and for a happy life as well as a new year. That was my Forbes op-ed that I would refer you to as it talks about the importance of these two. Uh, go ahead, Ali. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Rashi. That, that was wonderful. That was really fascinating. I guess so definitely connects with your, your mention just now of the, the Forbes op-ed, I think, and I'll certainly look it up. I was wondering if you get the feeling that this pandemic has kind of been a wake-up call perhaps for some companies, and if you think it has perhaps, or have you seen any instances where it might have given uh, companies new ideas about how to couple the sense of purpose and capability development or deployment uh, in new ways. Yeah. So, Aline, you know, first of all, big fan of your work too, as you're thinking about this seriously. A same, same goes for you too. And I think that we do need to think a lot more as Asim and Aline are doing, uh, you know, a paper by Seth Carnahan, um, Brad Greenwood and uh, Birch, Birch Greenwood and um, Carnahan and Greenwood. They actually look, no, not them. Uh, I'm confusing my students' papers too. So this is a paper by Seth Carnahan and uh, Dan Olson and David Krasinski that actually look at post 9-11, what happened to lawyers in terms of doing pro bono work and then also thinking, rethinking what they are. So for sure, I do believe that when you have these external shocks such as the pandemic, it is a time for us to pause and reflect and it's a discontinuity that is imposed on each of us as individuals, first and foremost, and then, of course, the organizations that we choose to be part of in terms of sense making. What is it? So this is the time when we really rethink what are our aspirations, what are our values? And that's what you're referring to. But in a recent paper, Aline, what we ended up uh, doing is, um, and this is a paper uh, which is still um, a work in progress, but here is what we find. Post COVID, we looked at a set of you know, Fortune 500 firms, particularly in the IT sector. We downloaded the data on Glassdoor reviews. And then pre COVID, we looked at their organizational identification. To what extent do the employees as reflected, and we did machine learning coding to identify this with the organizational identification variables that are used in the OB literature. And so we looked at the pre-COVID organizational identification slash employee engagement variables to predict post-COVID financial performance. And what we end up finding is that firms that had high organizational identification actually did far better than firms that had low organizational identification. And part of it was because in the post COVID period, when we look at the Glassdoor reviews, you end up seeing that these employees are talking about the fact that their leaders are not only focused on their own safety and uh, support and providing them training so that they can uh, deal with the post-COVID uh, disruptions in their own life, but that these firms also had a very strong customer focus. And so the strong organizational identification seems to matter really for financial performance too. So going back to, it's not an either or between purpose and profit and firms that figure out how to create synergies it's hard to do, but when you do it, you also get the monetary rewards. 
So uh, next up, uh, Roger has a couple of questions, but I don't think he can unmute himself. So I'm just read them okay. out loud to you. The first question uh, from Roger Roy is, uh, is the effect of stable leadership endogenous to technological change? Uh, and the second question is, do the synergies between the co-founder and the ringleader uh, lead to a trade-off, uh, which is related to your, uh, to, to your paper, to Porter's What a Strategy HPR piece? So. So the first question, Raja, I mean, in the cotton spinning industry itself, what was cool is that the machines themselves were imported from Britain. However, who imported the machines um, uh, is, is something um, that is endogenous, right? And what you end up seeing in that paper and in Sergey's sister papers on acquisitions and divestiture. So he's got this very nice paper in AER where he shows that firms that had better technologies embedded in them because they entered later with superior technologies, but they had inferior managerial talent, the, the productivity of those plants improved when the center of gravity firms uh, acquired these plants. And as a result, if you're looking at the productivity of these technologies that were being imported in to Japan, you see that it was much higher under stable shared leadership rather than the firms that did not have these characteristics. Um, the second question relates to, um, the paper with uh, Sonali and um, Raj, do the synergies between the co-founder and the ringleaders lead to a trade-off? I'm not quite sure which trade-off you're talking about um, because the synergies are really about thinking about the best capabilities matching with each other and they're making sure that there's value alignment. So in that case, there's no real trade-off because they can, in fact, think through these strategic directions and choose in a manner that is consistent. And this is where, again, the sister piece on transactional memory system shows that these teams who have synergies find, spend less time figuring out what needs to be done because they are aligned to begin with. So uh, Miriam, I think this relates to your question. Curious about similarity. Go ahead, go ahead and say that, Miriam. Hi, good to hear, good to see, at least hear your voice. So yes, so here I am. Uh, so thank you for the talk, first of all. So the, the, the thing that uh, I'm uh, curious or in any case that uh, um, uh, is, is very interesting here is this uh, uh, dichotomy or this complementarity also between the uh, ability talent on the one hand uh, and the similarity based on uh, uh, aspirations, values, principles. So I was uh, wondering what this is about in the sense that what type of elements uh, 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 define this type of, uh, of similarity first? And second, how do people find out about uh, this type of complementarity? Because it is uh, quite difficult. So when you have some kind of more tangible abilities uh, based on, I don't know, uh, uh, technical abilities, education, and so on and so forth, uh, that is easy to, uh, uh, um, to, to determine and to find out uh, uh, in, in terms of complementary abilities of people. When, but when it is about values, uh, when it is about principles, uh, that is quite hard, right? To, yes. to, to understand who I match with and how organizations uh, can help uh, to develop this, uh, uh, these values uh, and these complementarities. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. Great question. So here is the way I would approach it. So let me first tell you what we observed in uh, Shah Agarwal and Ichambari, and then also let me tell you how my own ways of figuring out the similarity attraction meets resource seeking for co-author team manifests itself, right? So what you end up seeing in the received literature is of course, secondary data tells us that firms, co-founders are likely to come from the same prior affiliation, right? That's why employee entrepreneurship. Or you're going to have them come from the same demography. They're going to come from the same college or they're going to, you know, so there's some similarity that attracts them together. It begs the question that among hundreds of other employees, why did you choose to, to venture out with this one employee and not 
at least 10 others that had very similar capabilities that also had the same prior innovation, right? Or when you think about college students embarking on a, a venture together, across all of their classmates, why did they choose this one person? And you could say very easily, oh yeah, they had complementary talent. But what we're finding out is that, yes, sometimes they work in teams and get to know each other and work on the idea, but more often than not, this prior experience gives them knowledge about other things that these people are doing along value alignment, along principles, along motivations. And so these networks matter not only because they help you identify complementary human capital, but among the people with complementary human capital, whom is it that you see eye to eye with? Right? And the reason why I'm saying this is you can see that happen when we choose co-authors in new projects and, and papers, right? We not only want to look for, so I could have worked with many qualitative scholars. Why did I choose to work with Sonali and why did Sonali choose to work with me? But in part it is because our shared institutional affiliation in Illinois created these hallway conversations. And the hallway conversations were not just about our complementary capabilities, it was also about what we were interested in and how much we were synergizing with each other. Did we see the world in the same way? Were we willing to argue with each other and resolve these conflicts in a productive, constructive manner, as opposed to taking positions and, and using powers and hierarchies? to determine that. So I think that those are the elements that we really care about when we think about similarity attraction. It ends up correlating with demographic characteristics and prior affiliation. But I think that the underlying things that we haven't really examined are the things that I'm talking about right now with you. I hope that answers your question, Mariam. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think we have one last question from Sam, but uh, uh, would it be okay for you to give a short, maybe a 20 second answer, Vajri? Sorry sure. about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I can do that. And then I'd also like to take just a minute to kind of bring it all home if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Sam, right? go ahead. Yeah. So, so Sam, go ahead. Uh, yes, Praha, thank you very much for the presentation. Your notion of human enterprise was super fascinating. And you mentioned a little bit about how conflict is resolved in, in terms of the building human enterprise. And, um, and apart from not focusing on the political uh, issue or hierarchy, but how do we in resolve other types of conflict because in, turn, in collaboration, sometimes we have cognitive conflicts. We think or we understand things differently or we have different cognitive backgrounds. Right. So I think that there is a lot of good work that's been done. And Kathy Eisenhart's early work on conflict is also a great example of it. Amabili has done some work on conflict too. The way I look at the role of conflict in the building of human enterprise is really as it relates to not the fact that there's no conflict. In fact, I would say that if there are value-oriented, strong and independent people that bring complementary capabilities, they're more likely to be in conflict as opposed to a team where one is dominant, one is subversive, or even where there is like complete division of labor and talent so people go ahead and do their own thing. But in my opinion, the first set of people, the ones where there is conflict, but they're willing to spend the time to resolve it in a productive manner, outperform either the team where there is a dominant and uh, people that are just followers or teams in which you kind of just, you know, the sum of the parts is the sum of the parts, but the whole is not greater. For me, conflict matters, and I see this even in my collaborative relationship. When co-authors are arguing because they're coming at it from different perspectives where they don't believe that things are happening, I find that there is more synergies that happen so long as you focus on trying to figure out what is right rather than a focus on who is right. So just to kind of put together all of this, let me, as, and I, as I've already alluded, and to many of the people today who are attending that are junior scholars or PhD students, 
I think what I would like to share with you is this, is this worldview that I have provided. You may call me Pollyannish. You may call me excessively optimistic. But the worldview that I ascribe to and the people whom I am attracted to in terms of this value alignment are people that look at each other first and foremost as traders, where you're independent equals, even if you are a doctoral student working with a senior scholar, if you think of yourself as an independent equal, you have a lot that you bring to the table. And what I as a senior scholar want is for you to challenge me, to question me, because again, the value that I get from these collaborations is that you help me learn, you help me widen my view of the world and you help me continue to grow. So the trader principle does not think of us as masters versus students, but as independent equals, that bring their own independent judgment and knowledge to bear. So this willingness to engage in difficult, daring action requires each of us to speak up and not be afraid. So please go out there and challenge people, challenge people respectfully, keep an active mind as opposed to an open mind, definitely not a closed mind, but an open mind, you don't necessarily know, you're not willing to take a position. An active mind, you are constantly synthesizing past knowledge, but you're willing to question and be challenged in case you're wrong so that you're willing to grow. So human enterprise is most important in our profession because we create new knowledge. And this new knowledge then helps those practicing and enterprising leaders to do what they're doing. Thank you for all of the work that you each of you are doing to help build our canons of knowledge through your own human enterprise.